the other animals humans eat, use in science, hunt, trap, and exploit in a variety of other ways, have a life of their own that is of importance to them, apart from their utility to us. They are not only in the world, they are aware of it, and also of what happens to them. And what happens to them matters to them. Each has a life that fares experientially better or worse for the one whose life it is. Like us, they bring a unified psychological presence to the world like us. They are some bodies, not some things. In these fundamental ways, the non-human animals in labs and on farms, for example, are the same as human beings. And so it is that the ethics of our dealings with them and with one another must rest on some of the same fundamental moral principles. At its deepest level, an enlightened human ethic is based on the independent value of the individual. To treat human beings in ways that do not honor their independent worth, to reduce them to the status of tools or models or commodities, for example, is to violate that most basic of human rights, the right to be treated with respect. The philosophy of animal rights demands only that logic be respected, for any argument that plausibly explains the independent value of human beings implies that other animals have this same value and have it equally. And any argument that plausibly explains the right of humans to be treated with respect also implies that these other animals have this same right and have it equally also. As a result of select media coverage in the past, to which this evening's debate is a notable and praiseworthy exception, the general public has tended to view advocates of animal rights in exclusively negative terms. We are anti-intellectual, anti-science, anti-rational, anti-human. We stand against justice and for violence. The truth as it happens is quite the reverse. The philosophy of animal rights is on the side of reason. For it is not rational to discriminate arbitrarily. And discrimination against non-human animals is demonstrably arbitrary. It is wrong to treat weaker human beings, especially those who are lacking in normal human intelligence as tools or models, for example. It cannot be rational, therefore, to treat other animals as if they were tools, models, and the like, if their psychology is as rich as or richer than these human beings. The philosophy of animal rights is pro, not anti-science. This philosophy is respectful of our best science in general and of evolutionary biology in particular. The latter teaches that in Darwin's words, humans differ from many other animals in degree and not in kind. Questions about line drawing to one side, it is obvious that the animals used in laboratories, raised for food and hunted for pleasure or trapped for profit, for example, are our psychological kin. This is not fantasy. This is fact supported by our best science. The philosophy of animal rights stands for, not against, justice. We are not to violate the rights of the few so that the many might benefit. Slavery allows this. Child labor allows this. All unjust social institutions allow this, but not the philosophy of animal rights, whose highest principle is that of justice. The philosophy of animal rights stands for peace and against violence. The fundamental demand of this philosophy is to treat humans and other animals with respect. This philosophy, therefore, is a philosophy of peace, but it is a philosophy that extends the demand for peace beyond the boundaries of our species. For there is an undeclared war being waged every day against countless millions of non-human animals. To stand truly for peace is to stand firmly against their ruthless exploitation. And what, aside from the common menu of media distortions, what will be said by the opponents of animal rights? Will the objection be that we are equating animals and humans in every respect when in fact humans and animals differ greatly? But clearly we are not saying that humans and other animals are the same in every way that dogs and cats can do calculus or that pigs and cows enjoy poetry. What we are saying is that, like humans, many other animals have an experiential welfare of their own. In this sense, we and they are the same. In this sense, therefore, despite our many differences, we and they are equal. Will the objection be that we are saying that every human and every animal has the same rights, that chickens should have the right to vote, and pigs the right to ballet lessons? But of course, we are not saying this. All we are saying is that these animals and humans share one basic moral right, the right to be treated with respect. Will the objection be 
that because animals do not respect our rights, we therefore have no obligation to respect their rights either. But there are many human beings who have rights and are unable to respect the rights of others. Young children and the mentally enfeebled and deranged of all ages, in their case, we do not say that it is perfectly all right to treat them as tools or models or commodities because they do not honor our rights. On the contrary, we recognize that we have a duty to treat them with respect. What is true of cases involving these human beings is no less true of cases involving other animals. Will the objection be that if other animals do have more, even if other animals do have more rights, there are other more important things that need our attention, world hunger and child abuse, for example, apartheid, drugs, violence to women, the plight of the homeless after after we take care of these problems, then we can worry about animal rights. This objection misses the mark for the rank and file of the animal rights movement is composed of people whose first line of service is human service, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals, people involved in a broad range of social services from rape counseling to aiding victims of child abuse or famine or discrimination, teachers at every level of education, ministers, priests, rabbis, Dr. as Reagan, the lives could, of could, these people demonstrate, the choice thoughtful so. people face is not between either helping humans or helping other animals. One can do both. We should do both. Will the objection be finally that no one has rights, not any human being and not any other animal either, but rather that right and wrong are a matter of acting to produce the best consequences, being certain to count everyone's interests and to count equal interests equally? This moral philosophy, utilitarianism, has a long and venerable history. Influential men and women, past and present, are among its adherents, and yet it is a bankrupt moral philosophy if ever there was one. Are we seriously, seriously, to inquire into the interests of the rapist before declaring rape wrong? Should we ask the child molester whether his interests would be frustrated before condemning the molestation of our children? Remarkably, a consistent utilitarianism demands that we ask these questions, and in so demanding, relinquishes any claim on our rational assent. With regard to the philosophy of animal rights, then, is it rational, impartial, scientifically informed? Does it stand for peace and against injustice? To these, all these questions, the answer is an unqualified yes. And as for the objections that are raised against this philosophy, are those who accept it able to offer rational, informed answers? Again, the answer is yes. In the battle of ideas, the philosophy of animal rights wins its critics lose. It remains to be seen which side emerges as the victor in the ongoing political battle between what is just and what is not. Thank you. How do you get up in the morning in the face of of the news that you're reading that things are getting worse. And here I think is where history is uh, where we turn for encouragement and instruction. If you look at how Native American people were once viewed and treated by the, the conquistadors uh, when they were viewed as not human beings and when the, their blood was used to fertilize fields. It's unthinkable today. When we look at slavery in America, when you could buy and sell and beat with impunity people of African descent. Unthinkable today. When women couldn't divorce her own property or get an education or vote. Unthinkable today. What history teaches us is that a few good people who are determined and who are persistent, who don't give up, can change the world. So what we have to believe as activists is that we're not going to do this tomorrow. The wall of oppression has to be taken apart a brick at a time. When we get a critical mass of people, change will occur. That's how I go to sleep at night. That's how I get up the next morning.